Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Songwriters on Process podcast. My name is Benno Papari, and since 2010, I've run the Songwriters on Process website, where you can find more than 200 conversations with songwriters about the creative process. I'm not here to talk about tour stories, band drama, how a band got its name, or favorite foods. My goal is to treat songwriters as writers, plain and simple. This is an intelligent conversation about the writing process between two writers. And today I interview Laura Veers. Uh, Veers has a new album out called Found Light on Belly Union. It is fantastic. And listen, I got to be honest with you. I'm just lucky. I don't know how she found time to even talk to me, given how busy she is, how many activities she does. Uh, So first of all, she says that for each album, she writes about 100 to 150 songs. There's that. And she is, she reads constantly. She is exercising every day. She paints, she does watercolors, and she is also learning to surf all of these things. Oh, oh. And of course, the biggest part, she's a single parent. So she has a family and she's doing all of these things. So again, I can appreciate, or I'm thankful that she found time to even talk to me. And I loved this conversation. Um, her answers are thorough, fantastic, introspect, introspective, and um, but there's a reason why she does all of these things at once. And she told me that she does several things at once, so nothing becomes too precious, and she doesn't become too obsessive over any one thing. So she finds that by dipping her toes in various different artistic endeavors or hobbies or things like that, nothing dominates. And, you know, she said as a single parent, if you have a family, you can't be a tortured artist. You have to be there for your kids. And that was in kind of our conversation about whether there is such thing as a tortured artist and being too obsessive. And you can't be tortured if you have other things, especially if you have a family. Uh, But I just I don't know how she sat down for this, given all of these things that she's doing. Um, One thing we did, and I guess the irony is that. We talked about how, and now as I'm saying this, I think it's even funnier, but we talked about how the best ideas come to us when we're bored, when we're not thinking about creating. And I I think I asked her at some point uh, how I find a lot of my great ideas come to me when I'm doing other things other than thinking about ideas, thinking about things to write about. And she has a name for that. She calls it the side eye. And she said, the muse doesn't want to be looked at hat on. So the muse gives her, she gives the muse the side eye. And I guess the muse gives her the side eye. But uh, that's, and I hear a lot, lot, that a lot from songwriters, how the best ideas come to you when you're not thinking about them. So anyway, I love this conversation. Um, just a lot of great responses. And uh, we talked for a long time. And uh, enjoy my interview with Laura Veers. So I always start, I guess, one of the questions I'd like to start with is, is it important for you to write every day in some fashion? I mean, some songwriters tell me that, no, don't push it. Others say you got to write every day in some fashion, whether it's songwriting or anything else. But how important is that to you as a writer? Um, I go through writing phases. So when I'm in a writing phase, I will definitely write every day. Um, and that's songwriting phase. So, but, so that would be like, I'm a single mom, but I was married for a long time, but I've been a single mom for two and a half years. So I treat it as when I'm in a writing phase, it is my job, but I don't do it very long. For example, my morning routine would be like, wake up, deal with the kids, get them out to school and then um if I'm in a writing phase I would work out and that means like I don't know 20 minutes with the Peloton app or like taking the dog on a walk or or sometimes it's something more rigorous like I do like to do long distance bike riding so sometimes I'll be like training for a longer ride and like go on a longer bike ride and then I'll like putter for a minute like unload the dishwasher and this is like actually all work time in a way because I'm like getting ideas and like ruminating while I'm doing all those other things like I get a lot of my ideas when I'm exercising and when I'm biking and like just walking and thinking so I I like a lot of that downtime is important to me in terms of like generating and processing ideas and like kind of mulling things over turning them around in my head but not not on the page 
then by the time I'm getting to write, it's like 11 and I'm like, uh, or 10 30. And then I'll like super get deep focused on it and like no social media, no, no. I mean, I sometimes have to Google something for research, but I really try to stay offline. And then it's like, you know, my process is very much like start with what you have, which means like, okay, you have these lyrics lying around, see what you can do with those. And like, it's not so much generate something new right now. It's like, I'll, I will sit down and just write a song, but a lot of my ideas come from those like liminal stage stages, states, the liminal places. So like dream state, I'll like wake up and write down a bunch of words. And the next day I'm like, oh, what did I dream about? Okay, yeah, that's cool, use that. And then I'll form the song from there. And then like, or on the walk, like, oh, that's such a cool line. Like I'll write it down or like voice memo it. And then like, so the whole writing time would be like an hour, an hour and a half. And then my guitar is in hand, usually guitar, sometimes piano. And then it's time for lunch. And then you gotta like start prepping dinner or like make the shopping list. It's like back to family time and then pick up the kids, do dinner, bedtime, all that stuff. So it's like the amount of time I'm writing when I'm in a writing phase is very short, but it's very, very consistent. And so that's consistency is that's the job side that I have really always stuck with for 25 years of writing. It's like, just, just get back there and do it. And, and then I'll take like six months or a year off after, after my album's recorded, I'll write like hundred to 150 songs per album. And then I'll, I'll record like 14 and then 10 will make the record and then wait for two years and then do it again. So and then there's the touring, there's the videos, there's the promo, like all of that stuff happens after the writing phase. And now I'm working on paintings as a craft. So right now I'm actually painting some watercolors. Um, but I like to um, I like to do multiple things at once so that I'm not like nothing's too precious and nothing's too like important and like heavy. And uh, then I can just like keep it going and um, not feel ever like there's this torture around it because certainly there can be that you know like there is obsession and torture but it's not really like it, it, it's sort of like muted by um that honestly like that family life because if you have a family you can't really be that tortured you gotta like do the things you gotta like be there for your kids and make the meals and figure out all the stuff and do the birthday parties. And, you know, it's like, you've got, you, you can't get lost in this like reverie of our artistic, whatever. And sometimes I feel like that would probably be my downfall. I don't know. I could see myself going down a dark path if I was allowed to. And I mean, not to say that like when my kids are out of the house, I'm going to go down a dark path, but I do have this obsessional nature that allows me to be really creative and productive but I really like that I have this like grounding element of being a mom to kind of pull me back to earth every day. That's interesting because as you say that, I think about, I think it's important to get when you're not creating to get completely out of that space so that when you come back to it, you're more refreshed, right? Yes. Breaks are really important. Psychological breaks, vacations, time away, doing other things. I'm learning to surf. Like, that's a really big part of my life too is just physical activity being outside outdoor activities hardcore outdoor stuff like it it balances it out because otherwise it's just you get I get like so in my head and just like tortured and I don't like living that way but I mean but I do love to create things so there's like that fine line you know you're like you're tortured by it but you also love it so one of the things when I was, you said something else that I believe in wholeheartedly. Uh, when I was a professor, I told my students, your writing process is always taking place. It's taking place when you're sleeping, when you're working out, when you're eating, <clears throat> when you're walking, when you're doing nothing. And if you look at it that way, and I think this is what you're saying, then when it comes time to write, it's easy, but getting people to see that as a writer, your writing process is always happening rather than only when, it, when you're putting pen to paper, I think that makes it a little bit easier so that it doesn't become daunting when you actually sit down to write. 
it's less daunting when you sit down. If like for me, at least it's less daunting when I know that somewhere in doing those other things, those ideas have been stewing around. Uh, and when I, and that to me breeds confidence so that it's less daunting when you actually sit down to write. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's why I like that, like starting with what you have thing. Yeah. So, yeah. If so have, like a quote, or if you have a line or if you have some chords or you have even like, so I invented a game. It's it's like a prompt writing system called Kaleidoscope Creativity Cards. And it's this pack of cards you can buy on my website. It's three decks. One is the structure deck. One is the lyrics deck. And one is the inspir- inspiration deck. But you can use it for poets, prose writers, or songwriters. And they're just prompts. And the prompts are basically the start with what you have. So this prompt is like, write about autumn. And the next one is like, use three chords from a song you like. And then the next one's like, stop making so much sense, like a quote from David Byrne or some other inspirational character. And you just follow those three prompts, write something that sitting like half an hour, an hour, and then do it again the next day with three new prompts. And I think that's just the thing. It's like a practice, like meditation, yoga, exercise, you get better. And if you start with something from somewhere else, like a card that's just telling you what to write about, it's been cool to teach those workshops, those songwriting workshops through um, with the cards, because People write radically different things with the same cards and Hmm. they they can summon up like this memory of their dad in the autumn, you know, or like the snow falling in their town on the first day of winter back long time ago when it's like right about winter, you know, they're, it's, it's like an entry point into an old memory or a feeling. And I think that that's just half the battle is find your entry point and, and then you're off and running. So I have a quote written down. You mentioned dish, dish, doing the dishes. I actually have this quote written down. I was going to read to you anyway, but you're not going to believe this. So Agatha Christie once said, the best time to plan a book is when you're doing the dishes. So she actually said that, and you said doing the dishes. So, <laughs> so and, and I just laughed when you said that, because one of the things I've been hearing in the past couple of years from people who have been, you know, not been touring as much or at all is the amount of ideas they get from the mundane activities, Mm -hmm. Um, the cleaning, the vacuuming, the folding, the clothes. And so I'd like to explore that with you as to why we think that that happens so much when, you know, I don't get ideas when I'm staring at my computer, my ideas are happening when I'm doing other things. So why do we think that is that so many of these ideas are coming when we're doing mundane activities? I, I call it the side eye. Hmm. You're just like, I feel like the muses don't want to be looked at straight on. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You got to look at them from the side. Like they're not really there. They don't want to be stared at, but they're, they're like, they have riches and such gifts. So, but it's like this sort of like woo woo kind of like juju thing. <laughs> and I think when you're doing those other things, you're focusing a lot on that thing too, right? Like you got to get the dishes clean. We have to have a clean kitchen. We can't have an enormous mess here every time. Like I can't cook well if there's like a huge mess in the kitchen. So I'm like always tidying, making things neat. And then like in that process, there's time, right? There's like rumination time. And um, same thing with like when I'm working on paintings now, I work on large canvases. I'll work on two paintings at the same time so that I'm looking at them both with the side eye. Like neither one is really my focus. And uh, same with the songwriting. It's like, well, you have these lyrics that you like, but you don't like the music. So just make up some new music today and then listen to it tomorrow. Like you don't know right now. You you have an idea about what you think is cool, but like you won't know till tomorrow. And maybe you won't even know for like a year about whether this song is really working or not. But it's like, allow it. I look at it from the side, not right at it. And it's like, and then, and then it can like come to life. And it's just a kind of strange thing to t- try to talk about because it's so, it sounds so weird, but it is, I have observed like the half paying attention thing, like the half focus, the half there, half not there thing is really helpful. There was an article in the New Yorker. It was probably it must have been 10 years ago. I think it's Louis Menon who writes about the process in the New Yorker. I think it was him, but he wrote this article about, and this is exactly what I think you're talking about, 
um, about the invention stage of the writing process. And, and I'm going to, if I have this correct, what he does is that he has a foyer um, and he, there's a table in the foyer and he puts these index cards on the table that are ideas for the article or the story, but they're not in any specific order. And what he finds is that rather than staring at that table and looking at those cards and rearranging them in an outline format, that doesn't work for him. What he does is he passes by through that foyer, you know, 20 times a day or something at least. And every time he passes by that table, he'll glance at it. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, nothing happens, but there will be one or two times a day when he glances at that table and those note cards and an eureka moment comes to him about the order Mm -hmm. and it happens. That's, that's the side eye. I think it's not, and that's exactly what he does. And it's a fascinating thing, uh, an article to read because he said, yeah, when I just stare at those, at those cards, nothing happens. But if I just glance at them for a second, every time I walk by, eventually something clicks. That's really cool to hear. Yeah, I, that that really resonates with my experience also. Um, so the other thing, and we talk about exercise. So I am a big runner mm-hmm. and uh, I wrote an article in the Washington Post about five years ago about there's a very clear link between exercise and higher order thinking. And so this has all been done in the lab. It's not, this is not, you know, snake oil science. What happens is that they've put, there's a chemical called brain derived neurotrophic neurotrophic factor factor that gets released in the brain uh, with increased blood flow, which is exercise. And what they do in the lab is they put people on treadmills for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then afterwards administer a battery of tests to those people. And those people always score higher on tests of executive function than people who didn't exercise. So There's about 90 minutes post-exercise when that you get that added benefit. And so this has been measured in the lab. So when people all the time talk about ideas they get while exercising or afterwards, there's actually proof behind that. And and, and what they've found is that it's about 30 minutes uh, at about 60% max heart rate, which is like no more than a moderate walk, and about 90 minutes post-exercise where you have that benefit. Uh, and what's interesting is that it's not dose responsive. So 60 minutes isn't twice as good as 30 minutes and 90% max heart rate isn't better than 60% max heart rate. So when we talk about exercise, improving creativity, there's actually research behind that. Uh, and it sounds like that's a part, big part of your process also, right? Um, yeah, for sure. I think, um, I think it's more intuitive for me than like scientific, but yeah, I just like, I like to move. It's my habit to move my body every day. And I, I probably intuited that, but I was getting benefits that went beyond like staying fit from it. Um, I certainly noticed that it helps with my mental health. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I even interviewed Craig Finn of the Hold Steady. He's in the article because he's a marathon runner. And so we we talked about that. But um, I use it as a part of my process as a way to shake out a rut that I'm in. And for me, it's a confidence thing. And I think, and for me, knowing that, oh, and when I go out on this run, I'm going to work through those issues. Uh, So for me, I actually use it as a part of my process. Uh, So I, I may run at a different time during the day when I'm in that rut, Uh, like a writing rut or, or what? Yes. A writing rut. Yeah. Writing rut. Um, and I'll, you know, if I just find that I'm at an impasse and it's oddly comforting to know that when I go out, it honestly could be just a walk even. And, and then it's oddly comforting to know that when I go out, uh, I, I, I'm relatively confident that those ideas will kind of, will shake loose. Yep. That's great. It, It makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so all these studies, I'm going to quote for you because since you're a painter, you'll appreciate this. <laughs> there was, um, a study in, uh, I read about this in Smithsonian magazine. Um, and I forgot where the study was, but it involved, uh, Salvador Dali. And there's a moment I forgot. I really should figure out the name for it. Um, there's a moment right before you fall asleep. It's when you're in that haze where you're not 
sleep, but you're not fully conscious yet. And yeah. there is a scientific term for it. So what Salvador Dali would do, and this is where they got the idea for the study, is he would sit in his chair and hold a skeleton key at ar- in his hand at arm's length with his arm fully extended. And with un- underneath his, his hand would be a saucer on the floor. And when he would enter that state, he would let go of the skeleton key. It would drop on the saucer, make a noise. He'd wake up and then start creating. That's cool. I'll send you that study too. Yeah, uh, that's cool. So, uh, and you mentioned sleep. And so I'm curious if you've ever had, where, when have those moments come to you? Have they come to you right when you're about to fall asleep or in the middle of the night or when you just wake up or when? Um, they're mostly in the middle of the night. Yeah. And in fact, the song I wrote on my upcoming album, Found Light, that I'm most scared of lyrically, I wrote in the middle of the night. I just got up, wrote it all down. And then I recorded it and then sent it to my producer, co-producer Shazada Smiley. And and then I was like, I I keep my songs cataloged and Dropbox in folders. So as I'm writing an album, it takes me a couple of years, but I'll build up like big piles of songs in, in the A folder. And then I'll go through and listen and be like, nah, this isn't good. I'll kick it down to the B folder. And sometimes they well, often I'll make a C too. I don't know why I just, I have three folders, but I then bumped this song to the B folder, but he got listened to it before I bumped it out. And when we went to make the record, he's like, why, why aren't you putting that one on there? I'm like, I'm, I said, I don't know. I guess I'm just, it's too vulnerable. He's like, that song's great. It's called time will show you. And it's kind of like, has like F bombs in it. And then like talks about casual sex in this way that I was like freaked out about. And that's why I dumped it. But I think like, I would not have written that song in my, in my like conscious state. Hmm. Because it's like, it's a cool mix of like um, otherworldly um, po- poetry with very hardcore details, like casual sex, Airbnb. So it's like a weird mix of poetry and like just basic banal, banal um, terms. And yeah. so I wouldn't have done that. I just wouldn't have, it just came out of nowhere because of the, what was coming from my subconscious mind in the middle of the night. And I'm glad he kept it because although it's a sort of sensitive song for me and it was like hard to let me, I was, I didn't want my mom to hear it. She's, she's <laughs> fine. She was fine. She did not like the first <laughs> album, but she didn't mind that song. But you know, it's like you can get to those vulnerable spots when your conscious mind isn't criticizing, like critiquing you and saying like, stop being, like, you know, protective, like you're, there's a part of our mind that wants to protect us and not share. And there's another part that wants to share because we want to be authentic and true and good writers and tell our true story. But that like, then the fear comes in and that's when I ditched the song. So my point being, I don't think I would have written such a brave song if I were in my full capacity, like my full normal brain. So those songs that happen in those moments that when you're sleeping or when you're at your most, those vulnerable songs, do you revise those a lot or are those songs that you'd rather keep untouched because of where they came from? I'm always revising. I'm like a heavy editor. Um, that one had a lot of lines that made it straight through, but mostly I, I pair down. Like I really strip it down. Almost always my lyrics are very like cold and like paired and stripped and like refined and down to the essence. Do you change words? I'm curious about that revision process. Are you changing words or are you taking, are you replacing them, taking them out? What does that right revision process involve for you? Mostly it's taking out. Yeah. It's like, it's like only keep the nuggets, like get a, get rid of all this chaff. Like let's get to the wheat, like, you know, just, and then, and then when I listen to music that I love, it's very much like that. It's like often, I mean, I love lush, complicated music too, but the stuff that really sings to me is often quite sparse, just like a guitar or voice. And, and what's singing about it is like the uniqueness of the playing and of the lyrics and the, vo- and the singing. So I aspire to that. I don't always get there, but 
as an artist, I try to use like simple tools to say something deep whenever I can. Do you, can you write for long stretches? I'm, I, I'm good for about 50 minutes, like five zero before I just have to take a break. But can you, can you sit down, you know, butt in seat and write for a long time without taking a break? No, no, I don't do that. I mean, probably max one and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. Usually more like 40 minutes. Now I'm going to read another quote to you because I, I have all these quotes because I know you're a big reader, big writer. So Eel Doctor, I think this applies to really songwriting, uh, painting, anything. So take your pick. This is what he said. Writing is like driving at night. You can only see as far as the headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. And I love that quote. Yeah. And I'm, uh, right. And, I, and I'm curious is that, and pick your, you pick your creative, whatever you want to talk about, you know, anything creative that you do. Um, do you write that way or create that way? Or is there an end point that you're getting towards? No, that's very much the way I write. That's the side I, again, Yeah. like you don't have a map, but you're following a road. You're on the road and you're driving, but you don't know where you're going. I mean, ultimately I know I'm going towards a finished piece. And that's something I'm definitely obsessed with in life. Like I love to finish things. It's very gratifying. So (laughs) I'll finish things like early, probably like, I I don't know. That's like something I need to work on is letting things be a little more not tied up, like less tied up. But I think it's also a strength because like, I do aspire to, when I sit down, write a whole song because the fragment thing gets on my nerves. Like Hmm. I just, I don't, I see that so much with my students where they're, I'm not teaching a lot right now, but I have taught over the years and they just like bring in a fragment. I'm like, it's just not a song if it's, it's one verse or one verse and one chorus. Like you have to finish it. You have to finish it. Like, I don't know if they're just, there's this like, fear in them to commit to finishing and for me it's the opposite it's an obsession with finishing and um sure I have a lot of fear too but I do love to finish things I just feel so good when something's done and then often I don't use it but like I said I finished it so then I have the feeling of like I'm going somewhere even though often I'm spinning my wheels because I listen the next day I'm like that song doesn't work but I'll be like oh the melody does. So use that or, Oh, the lyrics are cool. So find new music, that kind of thing. So I'm always finishing, but mostly I'm not using any of it. When I was in graduate school, I learned this trick and, and I still do this when I'm writing things. Um, I produce a skeleton draft. So let's say if I'm writing something that's 10 pages long, uh, what I'd rather do is write a complete draft. That's only 30% of those 10 pages. So I just have to fill stuff in. It's like a skeleton rather than writing the first three pages. So does that make sense? I mean, I, I, I tend to, and I think this is what reminds me of what you say is because if I write a skeleton draft that has a beginning, middle and end, but I have to fill it in, I still feel, I still feel like I've completed something like I've actually finished it. And that to me gives me more confidence than if I say, than if I say, okay, I've got a 10 page draft, but I'm only going to write the first three pages. Um, and it gives me a sense of completeness and confidence by writing that skeleton draft. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I think whatever you can do to trick yourself into feeling of some sense of completeness and confidence is like your key to the whole thing. It is. I agree. It's kind that's why the ritual, I talk about the ritual all the time. I do think it's important to have a writing, which will like, I never write and revise in the same chair. Okay. Um, and that's because I feel like when I revise, I need to get as far away from my writing process as possible. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's important to have certain things with me to be in a certain place and whether it's superstition, I don't care. Uh, but that ritual is an important, I, I think it's important to know what works for you. I just don't, I, when I talk to songwriters and they just tell me, yeah, you know, I just write whenever and it's not any process and I just kind of sit down and that works for them, but that would drive me crazy. 
Yeah, I'm definitely more of a structured person. I, I want to have like time that I'm doing as a practice. It's not a, as a practice. It's just what I do. I like to do it mostly. Like, I think it's, I remember when I first started writing songs, I was 19. I'm 49, almost 49 now. And um, I was like, oh, this is so fun. I just thought it was so interesting and like a little puzzle. You could solve, like puzzle solving, really. And um, I still feel that way. So that's a nice thing. That's like a fun, That it can be really fun. It can be like, if you make it small like that, it can be like a really cute, fun project. And then at the end, you're like, oh man, I just wrote a really cool record. You know, like after having just sat there and puttered around for like two years. Right. Now you said you have 150 songs per album, I think is what you said. So what is the, what is the initial weeding out? Are you just looking at those 150 and saying, okay, there's 50, I can immediately toss aside. That's an incredible amount. So I'm curious how that's, when do you, how do you whittle those down in stages to eventually, like what's, what, what doesn't make the first cut, I guess, is the way to ask that. Well, so they usually all make the first cut because I think they're amazing. Like when, <laughs> <laughs> right when I write it, I'm like, oh, that's so good, you know? And then the next time I'm like, that's such a piece of shit. But again, it's like, there's something in there. Keep going, you know? And then eventually like, so when I say 150 songs, there are 150 demos in those folders, but a lot of them are sort of the same thing moved around, like turned upside down, like similar lyrics or similar music but they're not distinctly different 150 songs they're sort of like recycled versions of each other but I'll just put them all you know as I start writing they this a pile builds up and then I'll go through the a pile and be like nope 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 go nope you're out and then back down to the there's like now there's three in the a pile but there's 10 in the b pile and then the a pile becomes 15 and then listen through nope 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 but one stays and then there, there's like 25 in the B pile and there's three or four in the A, but you know what I mean? Yeah. And then the C, that's why the C folder comes in. Because sometimes B actually, I'm like, well, maybe that one's okay. Maybe I'm being too harsh. So this one is definitely going to C, the C pile. I, I think that's fascinating because I hear stories from songwriters about their incredibly complex organizational process and i think a lot of people think that song don't realize that songwriter i can't tell you how many songwriters have told me they have excel spreadsheets uh -huh. of of and 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 i think that goes against what people want or would expect an art an artist to be like um you know you have song titles and lyrics and excel spreadsheets that's not very artistic right but uh i think you need that stuff oh yeah i mean the artists I know who do well are very organized and they're hustlers and they never stop working. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to throw out an Ernest Hemingway quote here. He said that all writers should go to art galleries. That's uh, cool. Yeah. And so let's talk about that. How do you, and I do find a lot of songwriters tell me not a lot, but if you've told me on their days off, they do go to art galleries. Um and I'm curious, I mean, I, I would agree with what he says, but why do you think that's important either for writers to go to art galleries or maybe why artists should go outside of their artistic endeavor for inspiration? Um, curiosity about life. I mean, that's a big one. What's out there? What are people doing? How do other people interpret this experience of living? Like what, you know, and also unbound yourself a little bit. Like, why do you think you're only a writer? Why can't you be a painter and a writer? Why can't you be a musician, a surfer, a painter, a writer, and a runner? Like there's a whole big world out there that you can, you can do a lot of exploring. And I think that's probably what he's getting at. Like let's explore the world and people's experiences and how they interpret the world. And I think absorbing and learning about how other artists uh, kind of filter it through their lens is helpful and interesting. Basically, it's, to me, it's just interesting to see how different art forms interpret the world and um, share vulnerability and human experience. 
That's great. I uh, spot on. Uh, when you write, is it is it difficult to write under intense emotional weight? Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, let's talk about that. I mean, is it because some songwriters do they can they can write endlessly um, with that emotional weight. Others, there's a limit and they need distance. So where do you fall in that? Very much in the distance camp. Yeah, I went through my divorce two and a half years ago. Right. And that was from my longtime producer, Tucker Martin, who also is the father of my children. And it was like a not nice divorce, not like we're just friends breaking up. It's like a really hardcore thing, complicated and difficult. And so multi-layered because we had this deep collaboration, which frankly, I became like heavily dependent on him for like, all the stuff we're talking about, not the writing itself, but like all the culling and the processing and the selection of songs and all the production stuff went to him. It was almost like a family business where I was the writer and he did like all the rest of it. I mean, I played the parts, but, and I sang, but like, I didn't really decide or care about so much of the other stuff. Like who's going to play on this? What's the instrumentation? Like, which songs are we going to use? I'm like, just whatever songs you like, you know? And so for this most recent round, I had to do all that myself, which was kind of like stepping into my big girl pants and hard at first to trust myself in terms of like, okay, well, which songs do you want to pick? You've got 150. It's your choice. You have to decide. And Shazad did help me pull that one out of the trash, which I'm glad he did. But um, when I was first writing, it was so hard because I was like, grieving this loss of this intense, long relationship it ended badly. My kids are like underfoot. I was going through pandemic. I luckily had a nanny living with us for the first nine months of the pandemic, which was right when my divorce was starting. Because as you know, like parents in the pandemic really had a hard time because kids weren't in school. Yeah. And so I, without my nanny, Lori, we just split the day. So she'd do six hours with them and I would do six or more. And I was able to do my work and exercise and like have a life. I actually was doing some dating before the pandemic, but, um, for the first year after the divorce, I didn't write it. I wrote a lot and none of them were good. They were just so dumb. Like I just couldn't get to hmm. the essence of the matter. Like I just, it was so, I tried, but they were just like, I want, I don't want to say cheap, but they just weren't high quality songs. And I know I can write high quality songs. I know, by that, I mean, like, songs that have some kind of depth to them in terms of emotion and, like, artistry in terms of, like, cool chords or, like, nice-sounding guitar parts or whatever it is. Like, I don't know what makes something deep or, like, not cheap, but I have a gut feeling about it, and I was not finding it. And, but I just, you know, like, I was also, like, dealing with severe like logistical complexities in terms of like undoing LLCs and like selling houses and buying houses and like, you know, like figuring out how to disentangle from someone that you've been like entangled with in like 14 million ways for 20 plus years. I had to do that too. So the writing had to take a back seat for a while. So I did some writing for that first year, didn't like them, took a back seat, like did other stuff, moved, and then um, got the kids settled in a new school and then started writing again in my new house. And then, the, the honestly, then after a year and a half had passed, then the good songs started to come out. So I would say like Chiamanda Ngozi Adichie has a nice quote about that, like trauma, about writing and trauma and how after like, they're just a distance often helps. Yeah, and like like the people who went through the Holocaust, hardly any of them wrote about that. But their their grandkids did. A lot of their children didn't even write about it. It's the grandkids and the great grandkids that are processing that. And I wouldn't say like every experience, like every divorce is traumatic. I don't know. There's like a fine line between something's hard and something's traumatic. But I did need that time away from it. Like I tried to write through it. And now I've learned like, I think I should probably take a break from writing during those times because... And, and I guess over the arc of my life, I've noticed I do better with my writing when I'm not, when I'm not really struggling with emotional stuff. I do. I'm a more prolific, deeper writer when I'm not going through like a really hard stuff. Okay. Last question. 
I read an interview with you in the guardian. This was about, I don't know, whenever that was three years ago ish. And they mentioned Sharon Olds, the poet. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I love Sharon Olds. I got a chance to see her read a few times. Um, When I was in college, she would give readings with Galway Cannell. And those two were two of my favorite poets. So I was very excited to hear a Sharon or to read a Sharon Olds reference. Yeah, I loved her. Yeah, uh, just beautiful. But if you ever get a chance, I think she and Galway Cannell read it as a, I think it's on YouTube. I it was I think it's the Dodge the po- Writers Conference or something, and they read their poems together and just amazing. So let's talk about who your favorite writers are, who you're reading now. Uh, and your right, your reading habits. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, I love Sharon Olds. I love how she writes these odes. Like I love her odes book because it's so fascinating. The things she she writes <laughs> odes about, like it's about a spoon, or you know, I actually there's this there's a poem about a spoon that um, Ross Gay wrote that I think is so beautiful and so deep and amazing. But I love it when poets like Ross Gay and um, Sharon Olds will take something small, like she writes about a tampon and just make it something so epic, you know? And I love that, like their ability to make these mundane things big. And that's something I aspire to as a writer is like make something small, big, instead of trying to to make something big, small. (laughs) And so, yeah, I love those poets and Ocean Vong I'm reading right now and his novel, which is beautiful and sort of surprised. Like, I love it when writers surprise me. A lot of his writing, like sentences come out of nowhere that really surprise me. Um, And my reading habits, I read The New New Yorker every week and I just like to keep up on like their take on um, society in general and also their take on music and art and books and things to read. But um, I usually read novels. I read Michael Pollan's um, How to Change Your Mind, which recently, which is a cool book about brain science and drugs, because I'm not much of a drug person. I don't really do anything. I'm kind of straight edge. But I did do mushrooms recently because of his writing about mushrooms and um, how they can change your brain and like help you process trauma. And they actually did do that. It was a very positive experience. So I kind of do a mix of like novels, New Yorker and um, like scientific kind of story, like Michael Pollan type books. Are there fiction genres that you gravitate towards? Um, not really. I mean, I like sparse, simple writing, like Willie Blouton's a friend of mine from um, the band Richmond Fontaine and also the Delines. He's another musician slash writer and, he writes in a very spare Western style. So I would say that that kind of writing does resonate with me because I'm from Colorado and that kind of like simple outdoor Western writing appeals to me. But I I, I do love all kinds of literature and all kinds of fiction. And I, I aspire to read more deeply and widely. Like I noticed that I took a year off of Instagram because it was driving me nuts. Like I was so obsessed with checking Instagram and just like being on Instagram and all the stuff I realized was unhealthy. So I got off for a year and then I got back on recently and my reading went down. Yeah. So I, I noticed like there's some disciplined things that I need to, I need to be more disciplined to read, read more deeply. And I do find like social media and the internet helps uh, det- detract from the, my depth of reading. I interviewed Robin Hitchcock. This is probably four or five years ago. And I think he was the first and still one of the only songwriters to tell me how much social media had affected his songwriting to the detriment of it because he was spending so much time on it. And what Um, did you say specifically about that? Like, I, I, I have to go back, but I think it was just the fact that he was spending so much time on it and not as much time reading good literature, good writing. I see. Yeah. Like kind of dumbing him down sort of. Yes. And I, right. I think that kind of stuff, it was not reading, it was not reading the New Yorker online. Right. Uh, It was Facebook. It was that kind of social media. And I, you know, and I thought after he said that, I said, well, I'm sure everyone, he's the only one that really said it so openly, you know, he said, it's absolutely affected my creativity because I, I'm spending too much time on it. Yeah. 
And it's not only the time, it's like the quality of mind. Yeah. Time. It's like this sort of surface mind time. Yep. Yeah. yeah. But it takes uh, discipline to stay off of it. It does. Absolutely. Uh, so any other poets, uh, you mentioned Sharon Olds, any others, I, 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 I tell you, I'm very distressed how few songwriters read poetry. Uh, very distressed. Um, so I'd love to hear that you do you read poetry, but anyone else besides, you know, Sharon Olds or, or uh, yeah. Well, Ross Gay is one of my very favorites. Yeah. Um, and Anis Mojgani is a great poet. He's actually a friend. He, he's the poet laureate of Oregon and he lives in my neighborhood. And he has some really beautiful poetry. Um, one of one of his lines, I morphed into one of my lines in, in a song on the new album. And um, I mean, as a writer, I love Rebecca Solomon. Yeah. She's amazing. And um, I read some Wordsworth. I was like, I, I should read the romantic. Let me read some Wordsworth and Coldridge. And I was like, I'm not into this. Oh, you're not. I was going to say, <laughs> well, I was going to say that. Uh, uh, well, that's very different. Like when you said taking the small ideas and making them big, that's the metaphysical, that's the metaphysical poets like John Donne. I mean, that's what they were known for. I think he wrote The Flea. Mm -hmm. um, so that's exactly what they did. But I was going to say, uh, well, I guess I'll say it anyway, that um, there's a book called The Friendship um, by a guy named Adam Sisman, And it's about the friendship between Wordsworth and Coleridge. And what they talk about, a big part of that book is how much walking they did uh -huh. and how many ideas they got for song idea i'm uh, not for poet poems yeah on walks I, yeah I um that. yeah and they estimated wordsworth walked a hundred thousand miles in his lifetime and were they would both actually wordsworth would compose entire poems on his walks and he had these amazing this amazing memory and he'd revise them in his mind and wouldn't come back until they were completed wow that's impressive um and I think one of them preferred rocky terrain and the other one preferred flat terrain, but they, but that was where they did a lot of their composing while they were on their walks. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Well, maybe I'll give it a second read. <laughs> and that's it for the latest episode of songwriters on process. Don't forget. You can find all of my interviews with over 200 songwriters on my songwriters on process website at songwriters on process.com going all the way back to 2010. You can read them, watch them, or listen to them. So until next time, thanks for listening.